Hi, Dr. Fauci. How you been? How you doing? I'm good, thank you. How about you? Good. I was very fortunate in that, you know, I really had a minor bout with COVID. And um, thankfully, um, I don't really appear to have any residual symptoms. You know, it's kind of interesting when you're running 100 miles an hour to determine whether it's fatigue that you would have anyway, or it's fatigue following infection. I'm I'm chronically sleep deprived. <laughs> yeah. Well, what were your symptoms? You know, it's interesting. Um, I think it was like on a Wednesday evening, as I was getting ready to go to bed, I felt like a little scratchiness in my throat. And I thought it wasn't a sore throat by any means. And I thought maybe is, you know, with the heat and the air conditioner and the dry air that it was causing some degree of uh, scratchiness. But then yeah. when I woke up in the morning, it was a little bit more severe. So I thought, I didn't feel sick, Katie, at all. I just said, let, let me take a test. And I took a test and it came out strongly positive. So I went on Paxlovid immediately. And over the next 18 hours, I developed a little bit of a sniffle. Um, I didn't feel great a bit, mostly fatigue, which is very interesting. It, fatigue is a very important part of this. Right. And I went on Paxlovid and, and the symptoms disappeared like within 18 hours. Yeah, but I was one of the ones that had a bit of a rebound. I was going to say, so many people are having this rebound uh, where the symptoms return, you test positive again after yeah. testing negative that you've so why is that happening so much? Well, you know, we don't know exactly why, but it may be that when you take Paxlovid early on, which is the time you're supposed to take it, that you don't give the body enough of a chance to respond to the virus immunologically so that when you withdraw the drug, the virus comes back. But the good news about it, and I think we, we really should, and I hope, well, I'm glad I'm talking to you about it to really... Um, dissolve confusion about this is that the Paxlovid is doing exactly what you're asking it to do. You're asking it to prevent you progressing to severe disease leading to hospitalization. If you get um, laboratory test rebound for a day or two and the symptoms return, almost invariably, it's very, very mild, which means that the drug was successful in doing what it's supposed to do in a certain percentage of people. And we still don't know what percent that is. It really varies. You know, the general studies show 2% and then other studies show maybe 8%. But when you talk to people, it seems that many people who you speak to are getting this rebound. So we don't know exactly what it is, but we should not let that be a reason not to take Paxlovid because Paxlovid will keep you out of the hospital. Good point. But meanwhile, as you know, Dr. Fauci, the latest strain, BA5, has proven to be not only more contagious, but hospitalizations are on the rise. So how concerned are you about this latest strain? Yeah, we have to be careful about that, Katie, because I think that's a volume quantitative reason. Let me explain. So if you have a certain percentage of people get hospitalized, the hospitalized to total case ratio, that could still be very low. But when you get so many more cases because of the inherent increase in transmissibility, you will purely by mathematical calculation get more hospitalizations. So even though they're reporting 120 to 140,000 new cases per day, it is very likely, in fact, I'm certain that the actual number is much higher because there are so many people who are home testing. They get a positive test. They either have minimal symptoms or no symptoms at all, but they don't report the test to anybody. Uh -huh. So the 130, 140,000 might actually be three or four times that amount. So even though the hospitalizations are going up, which is not an acceptable thing, we don't want hospitalizations to go up and we certainly don't want deaths to go up.
But the thing that's concerning to me is that the deaths are still hanging around three to 400 a day. And if you do the math on that, you know, you're talking over 100,000 deaths per year, which is a very unacceptable number of deaths. So we've got to get that number very much lower than that. And you do that by the common, common sense public health measures. If you're not vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you are not up to date on your boosts, get boosted. If you're in a setting where you're concerned about whether or not you're infected, even though you don't have symptoms, tests are widely available and free. If you do get infected and a test is positive and you are in a risk category, go on Paxlovid. If you're in an indoor congregate setting and you go to the computer and click on the CDC map and you see that the county that you're in is an orange or a red zone, then when you're in a congregate indoor setting, wear a mask. You know, when we're not talking about, you know, the radioactive statements of mask mandates, we're talking about common sense recommendation that if there's a lot of infection dynamics, it's prudent when you're in an indoor congregate setting to wear a mask. Right. Are most of the hospitalizations involving unvaccinated individuals? Yeah. Yeah, if you look at the difference between what is the 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 fold increase in in, in hospitalizations and death among people who are completely unvaccinated versus people who are vaccinated but not up to date on boosts and people who are vaccinated and up to date on boosts the difference in hospitalization is overwhelmingly higher proportionately of people who are unvaccinated now, some vaccinated people who are at high risk, either very elderly, frail, underlying immune compromise, those people can in fact and do go on to hospitalization and some of them die. But when you compare on a case by case basis, it's overwhelming evidence that unvaccinated people are at a multi multi fold risk more of a getting in, uh, getting hospitalization and dying. A lot of my followers are asking though, Dr. Fauci, about additional boosters. And they're saying it doesn't seem to be efficacious some of the, against some of these new strains. So yeah. what is the point? Well, th that's a great question. And that's why we keep, and, and it's an understandable source of confusion, but look at the data. What, what are we asking the vaccines to do? We're asking predominantly that they prevent us from getting significantly ill, particularly needing to go to the hospitalization. Now, we're getting people who are vaccinated and boosted who are getting infected, like me, <laughs> like the right. president of the United States. But what the vaccine does is really very nicely prevent you from progressing to severe disease. Now, what we do need, and just yesterday, you may have heard, we had a vaccine summit at the White House in which right. I gave a talk about what the next generation of vaccines will look like. And what we do need are vaccines for the future that will give you a greater breadth and durability of infection, as well as a new form of vaccine that you could administer internasally, which will protect you more from getting infected as well as transmitting. So sort of a pan, a pan coronavirus vaccine, I know you talked about, but that sounds complicated and, and potentially very difficult. How realistic is yeah. that? And when do you think something like that might be available? Well, you know, the holy grail of a truly pan coronavirus. That means every type of coronavirus. As I mentioned in my lecture at the vaccine summit yesterday, you wanna take incremental steps at a time and start off with a pan SARS-CoV-2 vaccine that gets all of the different variants that we've already experienced as well as any variant of that particular virus that we might experience in the future. 
like this fall or this winter. The next step is to get a pan virus, which is that group of coronaviruses that are clustered around the bat human interface so that if we get another jumping of the species from an animal to a human, we'll be able to have a vaccine that protects. And then the ultimate holy grail is to get one that includes all coronaviruses, including the common cold coronavirus. Now that's aspirational. The first step that I mentioned, I think realistically it's going to take a couple of years, really. I, I think we'd love to have it five months from now. It's to, to get it proven to be safe and effective in a big study. It, it's not going to happen in the next few months. So basically it has become what you said, sort of endemic and it's something we pretty much just have to live with. And, you know, by the way, Dr. Fauci, people are getting this like two and three, two or three times. I mean, is there any limit to the number of times somebody can actually get this virus? Yeah. Most of the time when you get repeated infection with the same or a similar related coronavirus, you have enough infection immunity built up that you may get infected, but it is unlikely, not impossible, but unlikely that you will progress to severe disease. If you look, Katie, at the history of common cold coronaviruses, you and I, throughout our lives, every winter, would get infected literally with the same virus we got infected two years ago or three years ago. I mean, not so much now when you're an adult, but even as you're a child and you're building up immunity. Right. That's or when you have little kids. <laughs> uh, it, well, I know you and I went through the same thing. I mean, that, there was a period of time when my three daughters were growing up. I spent half my time blowing my nose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's just one of the things when kids bring home infections. But the, 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 the encouraging news about that is that the, the, the subsequent infections of the same virus in almost invariably, in medicine, you never say always and you never say never. But almost invariably, it's going to be a less severe infection. So what we're trying to do is to get this virus to a low enough level in society that it doesn't dramatically perturb the social order. And by the social order, I mean the economy, going to school, going to work, you know, worrying and looking over your shoulder that you're going to inadvertently infect a person who's, you know, compromised and you'll wind up you know, having someone get ill because of your association with them. Uh -huh. We're not at that level yet, Katie, because, I mean, having, you know, several hundred thousand infections a day, having three to 400 deaths, having 40,000 people in the hospital is not the endemic level that we should choose to say we're going to live with it. We've got to get it much lower. And there are things that we can do to get there. Unfortunately, given the fatigue that we right. have in this country from two and a half years of this, everyone is tired of it. So it's very difficult, superimposed upon an anti-vax type feeling among some, superimposed upon the political divisiveness we have in this country, which, you know, and, and the social media misinformation and disinformation, it's very difficult to get people to adhere to common sense public health measures. Let's move on to monkeypox. As of right now, at the end of July, there are 4,000 cases documented in the US. 99% affect men who have sex with other men. The virus was first discovered in 1958. So why are we seeing this now? Well, it's the issue, first of all, monkeypox is a virus that is endemic in certain Central African and West African countries. It almost invariably goes from an animal, jumps to a human, and with some exceptions, at least up to now, we're investigating if anything has changed recently. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Central Africa particularly, it usually, when it gets into the human host, it is a dead end. It doesn't have a chain of transmission that is prolonged. What 
looks like it happened, and we have to make sure we nail this down epidemiologically, is that associated with gay pride galas and get-togethers that it got inserted, the virus did, into a population where the modality of spread, which is close skin-to-skin -skin contact, as you would have in a sexual encounter, not exclusively in a, in a sexual encounter, but when you have multiple sexual partners where you don't know the status of that person, that is a very easy way for a virus to spread within a demographic group. So something happened and it was likely someone who was infected in an African setting, got into a setting of a sexual network, and then you wind up at now having very much predominantly in men who have sex with men. Now, the, the issue we face that's a sensitive issue there is that we want to make sure that we need to do, you know, a four pillars on this. We very unlike the way things were in the early years of HIV, when we didn't know what the agent was, we didn't have a diagnostic, we didn't have a therapy, and we still, in fact, don't have a vaccine. We were like swimming in the dark. Right now, we have a vaccine, we have testing, and we have therapeutics. And we've got to reach out into the community to alert both the community and the physicians and healthcare providers that take care of them, that we have a problem now that's spreading. So since we have knowledge of the etiologic agent and we have interventions, the real challenge is to get in an expeditious manner those interventions to the people that need them. We started off with very few tests, 6,000 a week. We now have 80,000 a week. We know, we know we have a vaccine that works. We've got to get it, you know, from where it was stockpiled into the- In, in Denmark? Yeah, and, and get it distributed. And, and right now, things are looking much, much better. You know, we have 300 and some odd thousand already distributed. We're going to have another 400,000 distributed very soon. And then we have eight, another additional 800,000 that we're going to be able to get out, we hope. Uh, and I think we will do that expeditiously. And we also got to cut down, and we are doing that, the CDC and the FDA are doing that now, cut down the paperwork and the logistic um, hoops that you have to run through to get right. a therapy into someone. Right. According to the CDC, 99% of people are expected to survive monkeypox. Right. Uh, but, but you've said you're worried about children and pregnant women in particular. Why is that? Because historically, if you look at what monkeypox has done in Africa and what monkeypox is capable of doing, the susceptible people are those who are immune compromised, young children, and pregnant women have a greater likelihood of getting a more severe outcome if they get infected. That's what I was referring to. A lot of people ask me to ask you about monkeypox being transmitted via airborne exposure. How likely is that? And if, say, I'm in the presence or I'm with somebody who has monkeypox, what are my next steps? Yeah. Well, first of all, you've got to make sure that there's no misunderstanding. On the one hand, balancing not panicking people, and on the other hand, being realistic about what we know. So right now we are studying the CDC together with the NIH is the natural history of this virus. We generally know how it acts and acted in Southern Africa, but we wanna make sure we understand that there's nothing different about this. And thus far, thus far, it looks like virtually all of the epidemiological uh, detective work that has been done indicates that it requires close skin-to-skin -skin contact with someone who has lesions of the monkeypox. There's very little, if any, in fact, no data to indicate, even though we keep an open mind, that it is spread by any other way. We do know from experience with smallpox and monkeypox 
that it can be spread through contaminated clothing or or, or other fomites, mm -hmm. call it inanimate objects. So right now, if when you say if you get exposed to someone with it, I mean, if you're a healthcare provider, you know, that's the reason why we want to vaccinate the healthcare providers because they are exposed to people who come into an emergency room or people who come into a situation. So you want to isolate a person while they're shedding virus. But the thing we have to be careful of, and that's the reason why we want to get a lot of reaching out into the community is that not everybody is fully aware. I mean, if you have a very painful lesion that's spread all over you, it's very clear that you have monkeypox. But in some cases, it may not be so clear. So you want to educate the community of what they need to look out for. But I would not want to say that people need to worry about being near somebody because then you get stigma. And stigma is the enemy of public health. So we shouldn't be saying, well, now the entire population is at high risk. It's not. We're going to keep an eye on what we call the natural history and the evolution of this. This is mostly a CDC issue. The NIH will continue to do research with clinical trials to talk about vaccines and therapies and things like that. But it's going to be mostly trying to track the natural history of this. And the more we track of it, the more knowledge we'll have. And the more knowledge we'll have, the more concrete recommendations can be made. And of course, we have to have a public health conversation without stigmatizing and ostracizing gay men, which of right. course happened during the AIDS epidemic. What are your biggest concerns about where this outbreak is going, Dr. Fauci? Well, I, I think that really the concern is that you may have a situation where it becomes much more um, aggressively spreading within the population at risk, as well as any spillover infections, namely from a person who is infected, who inadvertently would infect someone else, which is the reason why you got to have an all hands on deck approach to alertness, reaching out into the community and making available testing, vaccination and therapy. You just hope COVID fatigue won't prevent people from taking this seriously? Well, you know, we've often heard, and I've heard, oh my God, we've had COVID for two and a half years and now we have monkeypox. It's a reality, we gotta deal with it. We just have to deal with it and, and that's it. We can't wish it away. We've gotta address it and deal with it. And that's the reason why, as I mentioned a moment ago, we've gotta get the interventions to the people who need them in a very expeditious manner. And we've got to make sure that we don't stigmatize a segment of our population, because as I've said way back from the, from the early years of HIV and now, the, the enemy here is the virus. Let's all pull together to fight the virus and not be pointing fingers or anything like that. Meanwhile, Rand Paul has been such a thorn in your side, Dr. Fauci, asking questions about gain of function research, the Chinese lab in Wuhan, threatening to launch a probe what is your response to, to that? You know, I, I don't really have any response to that, um, Katie. I mean, a couple of papers have come out now uh, in Science Magazine from 30 investigators from 20 countries that have really shown a lot of, lot of very clear scientific data about the evolution and the origin of this. So, you know, we always keep an open mind, but you know, you could continue to pursue and 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 tweet conspiracy theories, but let's look at the science. Um, with regard to what he's going to investigate, I mean, we're an open book. I mean, we have been all along, so there's nothing that the scientific community in the United States has to hide at all, that's for sure. You've announced you're stepping down at the end of President Biden's first term. Gosh, what a career you've had, right. Dr. Fauci in public service, when you think back at all the challenges you've faced and everything that you've accomplished, what are you proudest of? Right. Well, first of all, let me make a correction, Katie. <laughs> and you being a journalist, as it were, know this could happen. Politico asked me. Uh oh. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it, it's a misperception, and I'll clarify it for you. <laughs> Politico asked me, uh, I 
think it was George Stephanopoulos a long time ago. It said, you know, you, you've been at this a long time. You know, when do you think you'll you'll uh, you'll uh, step down? I said, geez, George, I don't know. I'm just working very hard at it. Then <laughs> someone asked me after that, because the idea of my stepping down came up. They said, if Donald Trump became president in January 2025, would you serve under him? And I said, very honestly, and innocently, whether Donald Trump or another Republican becomes president or Joe Biden gets a second term, I do not plan to be in this job by January 2025. That headline was, I'm staying at the job until January 2025. That's not the case. I said, I will not be at the job on January 2025, which means I will retire from federal service anywhere between now and then. <laughs> and I haven't made up my mind when that's going to be. And one little footnote to that, what I jokingly but seriously object to is the word retire. Because when I step down from federal service, I will continue to do in a different venue the things that you were asking me about in my career. What do I feel the proudest of? Well, certainly there are there are things that that are, I, I naturally feel proud of is that my 54 years at the NIH, my you know curing earlier before AIDS diseases that were rare but were quite deadly, certain inflammatory diseases, establishing the AIDS program at the NIH, being an important part of the development of therapies that have saved millions of lives, being the principal architect with the George W. Bush, our president then, of the PEPFAR program, which has saved about 20 million lives, and having the honor and the privilege of serving seven presidents. So those are the things that I've done in the past, and some version of that, I will very likely continue in a different venue when I leave the federal service. What about being a professor at your beloved alma mater, Holy Cross? <laughs> you know, anything is possible. I'm not thinking about that in any concrete terms right now, Katie, because I'm, as you know, I'm not, I'm not fooling you. I'm pretty busy <laughs> right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Thank you, Dr. Fauci, for your time and, and constant presence and for dealing with all these crises with such equanimity and uh, helping to reassure the American people. We really appreciate it. But I bet you've never seen such politicization in your job as you have in this most recent round with the coronavirus. And it must cause you to shake your head and it's very uh, disturbing, Katie. And the reason it's disturbing because it really is one of the things that you least want to see when you're fighting a global pandemic. If ever there was a time for all of us to pull together, it's when you have a historically deadly pandemic that has killed a million Americans thus far. And we're having such misinformation and disinformation and conspiracy theories and outright untruths being circulated in the social media. That's terrible. That's terrible. Well, keep fighting the good fight, Dr. Fauci. And thanks again for your time. Anytime, Katie. Always good to be with you. Take care.